Hey guys, welcome to the Tuesday Tune. My name's Steve, I run Vorsprung Suspension up here in Whistler. And this week, I'm gonna to talk to you about pedal kickback and chain growth, as well as the effects of the chain on the suspension. So this is something that uh, gets discussed quite a lot. Uh, there's a few concepts I wanted to go through with you guys, clarify a few things, and explain a few concepts that I haven't really seen discussed elsewhere to date. For anyone who isn't aware of the, the phenomenon of pedal feedback and chain growth, Basically what it arises from is the geometry of the suspension and the chain line itself, meaning that as the suspension moves, it will tend to pull on the pedal. So if we watch the pedal here, as I grab the top of the wheel and try to move it as vertically as I can, you'll see how much that's pulling back. This is a well-known effect uh, and relatively well documented and understood. When we're pedaling, we've got pressure downwards on this pedal here. As the wheel moves up, then obviously it's pulling against our foot. What that means is that while we're pedaling and pushing down on the pedal, if we're riding flat pedals in particular, this will pull the pedal harder into our foot. What is definitely more of a problem is when you are climbing, for example, and you hit a bump while you're climbing, suspension compresses, pedal pulls up into your foot. That's not the problem. The problem comes from when the suspension extends, pedal drops away from your foot suddenly. That can very frequently lead to your feet kicking off the pedals. That comes about from the momentary chain slack, essentially. So it just releases the tension that you're pushing against while you're pedaling. A secondary concern, less of a concern if you're running clipless pedals, um, is the disturbance to your pedaling stroke and cadence. It disrupts your rhythm some. That alone, not that big of a deal most of the time. If you're clipped in, especially, uh, if you're on flats, more of a problem. The second thing that we see talked about quite frequently is the effect of the chain on the suspension while we're coasting. Some of you guys will definitely remember Aaron Gwynn winning a World Cup with no chain. And a lot of people commenting on how much better suspension works when uh, there's no chain on it. So the first thing to understand is that when we're coasting, the free hub is able to unload slack. So if we have a look at, again, watching the pedal closely while the wheel is static, there, and we see that pedal moving backwards as the chain pulls on it. And then we take note of what happens when the wheel is spinning and the free hub is essentially disengaged from the hub to begin with. So if we have start that wheel spinning there, then you notice the effect on the pedals is much smaller. Now, what we'll see is a certain amount of friction in the bearings and whatnot here, and that's still gonna pull on that. But in order for this to actually significantly pull on the pedals in the way that it was before, what needs to happen, I'm gonna demonstrate that again, what needs to happen is that the suspension needs to move so fast that the free hub is essentially forced to catch up with the rest of the wheel. If it can't do that, then it won't actually pull on the, it won't engage the free hub. So the poles won't engage, it won't be able to transmit any force from the wheel through the chain to the pedals. There are situations where even though we are not pedaling, we can get that feedback through the pedals. One example is a really low speed drop uh, to flat or something like that, that will move the suspension very quickly even though the forward speed is very low. Uh, so wheelie drops to flat, especially if your bike has a lot of chain growth, a lot of pedal feedback on paper, that will mean you can feel it. The second instance is if the rear wheel is locked. So if you are applying the rear brake, fortunately this bike is set up with brakes the correct moto way. If you're applying the rear brake, then you'll see that that is still pulling on the pedals. That means that you can be going quite fast, uh, not pedaling, and still be actually receiving significant pedal feedback. Especially on long travel bikes that have a lot of pedal feedback. Uh, the original Yeti 303 was a great example of this. <laughs> as soon as you lock the rear wheel, you really feel it hammering on the pedals. Now, none of this still explains why it is that people almost universally report an improvement in suspension performance uh, once the chain is removed. Part of that comes from simply a reduction in noise and the effects that we notice. When you can't hear what's going on, you don't hear your chain bouncing around, even with the clutch derailleur and whatnot. When you don't hear your chain bouncing around, uh, there is a perception that it must be smoother. And in my opinion, that's why people like having a light bike. It feels smoother, it sounds better, it sounds like something isn't going wrong. But there is another dynamic effect at play, and that is the actual momentum of the chain and the angle that the chain is at as it bounces up and down. And so, we're gonna take this bike out of the sand, drop real hard on the ground a couple of times, and just give you some idea of what is actually going on in a highly dynamic sense with the chain. 
And then we're gonna to go to the whiteboard and try and piece together how that actually interacts with the suspension. This is gonna start fairly simple and then it's gonna get really hard to understand. So what we're gonna show you here is the effects of what happens when, in terms of the chain angle and chain bounce, uh, when we drop the rear end of the bike. We're just gonna drop it straight as it is and you'll see the chain moving up and down. You'll also see the pedals get flung backwards. Uh, this will be something representative of like a really low speed wheelie drop. So we have insignificant forward rotation of the wheel, unloading the free hub, but we have a very high velocity upwards of the rear axle relative to the frame. So that's creating a lot of uh, kickback. Right, so here we are, back at the whiteboard. Nah, I know a few of you just looked at this and thought, no, nope, fuck this, I'm going elsewhere. All right, so how, let's have a quick look at the fundamental forces involved in anti-squat. You'll see for a sec you'll see in a second why this is relevant to the chain interaction with the suspension, even when we're coasting, when we're not pedaling. So, in order of operations, first thing we do, we pedal. We apply some load to the chain. Let's say we generate 1,000 newtons in the chain. What that does, Secondly, is generate this tractive force at the tire. So it's a horizontal force at the rear tire, and that's in proportion to the ratio of radii, or diameters, of the rear cog and the wheel. So if the rear wheel is 375 diameter, and the rear cog is 75 diameter, then we have a ratio of five to one. So a thousand newtons of chain force means 200 newtons of tractive force at the tire. That means then that as we're, our center of mass is up here, as we're trying to pull the bike out from under ourselves, that rotates backwards. Uh, for anyone that hasn't already read Dan Roberts' uh, very good explanation of anti-squat on Pink Bike the other week, go check it out. There's also some fantastic uh, explanations of anti-squat out there. Tony Fuali's book, Motorcycle Chassis Design, The Art and Science. Vittorio Kosselter's book, uh, Hugh McClay's website, iTrack Suspension. There's a lot of good explanations of what anti-squat is. I'm not actually going into that right here. I'm looking at the forces internal to the system because this becomes very relevant in a minute. So anyway, center of mass has an inertial force that's equivalent to the tractive force of the tire. So we're trying to pull it forwards, it's trying to resist and push back. And so that is what creates this rotation backwards where we load up the rear tire. We create the additional vertical load on the rear tire, we reduce it from the front, and that's what's trying to compress the suspension when we pedal. So anti-squat is trying to counteract that by creating a certain amount of extension force when we're pedaling by using the chain and the drive forces, so the tractive force here, to create a moment that is trying to extend the rear suspension to the same degree that we're trying to compress it. So if we balance those out exactly, there's no bob in theory. So if we balance those forces out, there's no net force, there's no move. Now in reality, we have the rider's mass moves up and down when you're pedaling and things like that. So it's not, it's not quite that simple. But anyway, the, the point stands. So what that means is that we have tractive force of the tire, the chain force here. Now in this case, I've drawn these to be exactly parallel. So I've drawn the chain line in as being horizontal, uh, simply so that we can just add them up horizontally. What that means is that we have this vector here, which is equivalent to the chain force, plus this vector here, which is equivalent to the tractive force from down here, and those add together to give us our total force in that direction that is caused by the chain and the, the tractive force. And so what that does, that creates this extensive moment on the suspension here. So that's creating this green force vector here, in addition to the driving force vector that is pushing through there. Now, what you'll find is that the vertical component of this is equivalent to the vertical component of this, and so it ends up being only a horizontal acceleration. What we also have though, is the, the normal load on the rear tire counteracting this extensive force. So the, generally speaking, these two, are, they're very close to parallel. They're not actually parallel in this particular case, but what's trying to, what the, normal force in the rear tire is trying to do is press the swing arm and what this green one is trying to do is extend it. So if those two cancel out then they basically disappear. So what is actually pushing the bike forwards? Obviously mechanically there's some connection between the rear axle and the front triangle and that is through the swing arm pivot. Now in this case we've drawn this as a single pivot. This still applies to multi-link bikes. The physics and trying to draw out all the force vectors gets a lot more complicated, but you can take that to be the pivot or the instant center or the center of curvature. They're all valid in this particular case. So this green force or the horizontal component of it is what's trying to drive the bike forward. Now, this of course is assuming that we have a straight chain line. Now, as we 
just showed by bouncing around with frame outside. When the back wheel hits the ground hard, even with the clutch derailleur, and it's actually almost more relevant with the clutch derailleur, the actual chain line varies. So even though, you know, we can have the cassette overrunning, free hub overrunning, so that means the, the wheel is spinning and the free hub is fixed. And so, you know, in order for this to actually move backwards fast enough that this uh, essentially catches up with the free wheel and can tug on the chain, that involves a very high shaft speed, so high vertical axle speed at a relatively low forward speed a lot of the time. Also dependent on the gearing as far as, you know, when that will happen and whatnot. There are a lot of variables here. But to go back to the original point, trying to work out why it is that bike suspension seems like it works so much better when there is uh, no chain on the bike. A big part of it is due to this. Again, right here, we're assuming that that chain line is a straight line. Let's just look at what's happening when the chain bounces around when we're hitting a bump. What it means is that, first of all, the chain distance has to essentially get longer from point to point. So that's why we have a derailleur with tension and built in. It can account for those changes in length. So it does that primarily for when we shift gear, but secondarily to allow for the change in uh, chain length as the suspension compresses. Tertiary effect is that it can account for some degree of chain bounce up and down and keep that compensated for. So as the chain gets longer from here to here, as it bounces downwards, right, we have a fairly heavy chain. Chains, you know, anyone that's ever held one, you know they're not a super lightweight part of the bike that bounces down. Now this is still applying whatever tension force is necessary to pull it back up, right? So its own inertia generates a force that's pulling down on the frame, it's pulling down on the wheel, and it's doing that both top and bottom now because it's not a pedaling force where we're only putting the top under tension. When we have a clutch derailleur, that adds a significant amount of force because, because now we have to overcome the force of the clutch in order for the chain length to be able to extend overall. So clutch derailers are actually, in some regards, quite bad for suspension performance. <laughs> Having said that, I'm not about to take the one off my bike because I don't like the noise either. But essentially, as this chain length changes, if we assume that you know we're holding the crank position constant here, so you've got your feet on the pedals, you're holding them consistent, that means all of this extra chain length has to come from the back. If that happens quickly enough, and that happens very dynamically, then that actually can re-engage the free hub. And so that free hub overrun all of a sudden stops being quite so relevant. The interesting thing to note about this is that it isn't directly related to the degree of anti-squat that your frame has. So however far down the chain can bounce actually has a considerable effect on this. And that's why some of the high pivot bikes that have a seat stay directly beneath the chain, the chain can't go anywhere, can actually reduce that quite a bit. The downside typically comes on the underside there, where if you have a, a very high pivot bike, then the effect of the, the chain tug coming from the underside of the chain is actually increased. There are trade-offs there, obviously, so you see an improvement on the top side, you see a, you know, a worsening on the bottom. The point of this is to highlight a couple of things. First of all, it isn't ever immediately clear whether the dynamic bounce of the chain would ever be enough to engage the free hub. Like, I can't give you a number that says, in this case, this happens, and in this case, this doesn't. Uh, it is an entirely dynamic effect. So obviously this is very difficult to quantify uh, in any particularly meaningful way. The interesting part about it though is that it isn't directly related to the amount of anti-squat that your bike has on paper under pedaling. Uh, it is somewhat affected by that, but it isn't necessarily directly affected that by that because how far the chain can actually bounce, uh, to what degree the clutch restricts that, how many links you have in your chain, uh, all these things actually affect it quite a bit and so there's not really any plausible or meaningful way to quantify that. However, it is an interesting effect just to be aware of and so when people go back and watch Aaron Gwynn's famous run from Lear Gang where he won without a chain and he got to the bottom and he commented, wow, the suspension works so great without a chain. It's like, this is a large part of the reason why. And everyone likes quiet bike. Anyway, guys, that's it for uh, this episode. Till next time, we'll see you then. Thanks for watching.